Hi, I'm Bill Simpson, and we're going to be looking at how to use UV visible spectroscopy to determine trace gas and aerosol profiles. This continues our previous tutorial about how we use spectroscopy to determine slant column densities and is specific to max DOS type observations, ground based observations. So, from the first tutorial, what we found was that we could analyze spectra we recorded to get elevation profiles, the measurements of the slant column density of O4 and trace gases as a function of the elevation angle. Now what we're going to do is talk about how we convert those differential slant column densities over to vertical profiles of aerosol optical properties and trace gas concentrations. First off, a little bit about units. Column densities, as we said earlier, are the uh, raw measurements of these type of spectroscopic observations. And we've already talked about the slant column density as the product of the concentration of the gas or the number density of the gas times the path length. Of course, in uh, the atmosphere, the path length may have a varying concentration along that path length. So we deal with that by integrating the concentration profile, the number density of the gas, over the length. And this integral is over the path length to give the slant column density of the gas. So that's really our full definition of the slant column density. A special type of column density is the slant column density where one would look straight up through the atmosphere. And usually we do this all the way through the atmosphere and talk about that as the vertical column density, V, of a gas. So the vertical column density is just the integral from the surface to the top of the atmosphere of the vertical profile of the gas, that is the number density of the gas varying with altitude, integrated over height. So we're going to be talking about these slant column densities, S, and vertical column densities, V. The ratio between S and V is something called the air mass factor. The air mass factor describes the ratio between those two, the slant column divided by the vertical column. This air mass factor comes from the idea of taking direct sun observations. And if the sun was straight overhead, you would be measuring the slant column directly equal to the vertical column, and the air mass would be 1. If the sun, however, was lower in the sky, the slant path becomes longer because you're looking more tangent to the Earth, and the air mass factor will increase to a larger value. So the air mass factor varies with the view that you're using. And specifically for Max Dois, it's going to vary with the telescope's elevation angle, which we're going to be calling alpha, and the solar zenith angle, how high the sun is in the sky, and we're going to call that theta. Um, so that's the idea, is that the air mass factor depends on where you're looking in the sky and the time of day, and we're going to use that information to get out the uh, vertical column, the amount from the observations, the slant column densities. The other saving grace is that the stratosphere, which contains many of the trace gases we want to detect down low, is less dense and has less aerosol in it than the troposphere. So typically the stratosphere has very little scattering in it and there's much more scattering down low in the atmosphere. So therefore, the air mass factors differ between stratospheric and tropospheric molecules. This is shown nicely in the work of Gerd Honinger, and I gave you the citation last time. And uh, this paper by Honinger et al. shows the air mass factors for stratospheric and tropospheric absorbers. And uh, this is shown in the figure showing the instrument down here, the observer, viewing at some elevation angle, alpha, above the horizon. We're looking at scattered light, so the light is coming from some scattering event and coming to our telescope down here. The scattering process, as we said, typically occurs in the troposphere, down low, below the stratosphere, because this uh, uh, absorber is assumed to be up in the stratosphere right here. 
the light through the stratosphere, because it hasn't been scattered yet, is coming from the sun at the solar's zenith angle, which is shown right as this angle right here. So as a function of solar zenith angle coming in, it goes on a slant path through the concentration and builds up a slant column that is larger than the vertical column, which is shown right here. So we see a slant column density, and then there's a scattering event, and the light comes down to us right here. On the right-hand side here, we show at different elevation angles shown in colors, 2, 5, 10, uh, the air mass factor as a function of solar zenith angle. And what we see is that for any telescope view, we get essentially the same curve right here. That indicates that anywhere we look in the sky, we'll see the same air mass factor for this stratospheric gas. The stratospheric air mass factor also increases as the solar zenith angle goes towards 90. That's, of course, sunset when the sun is 90 degrees off the zenith or the solar elevation is zero degrees. So what's going on here is as the sun goes lower and lower in the sky, we get a higher and higher slant uh, column through the stratospheric layer and a higher and higher air mass. This says that doing uh, observations of different elevation angles really doesn't change at all the uh, information content. So your stratospheric information only comes as the sun sets or rises. That's the only time when the air mass factor changes. And specifically, it'll be at a value of 1 when the sun is directly overhead. And that makes sense, because if the sun's directly overhead, then the air mass factor is going to be unity. Okay, so the take home from this slide is that for a stratospheric absorber, it doesn't matter what elevation angle the telescope looks at. All that matters is the solar zenith angle, and your whole information is twilight morning or evening data. On the other hand, for a boundary layer absorber, the air mass factors are a strong function of the uh, telescope elevation angle and a very weak function of the solar zenith angle. So what we're going to look at right here is we're going to have a trace gas profile down here near the ground, shown schematically right here. And then we're going to have a path through that trace gas layer. Typically, the scattering event will occur above that layer, and the sun will have the light will have come through the stratosphere. And in this case, this gas is assumed to have nothing in the stratosphere. So what we see for the air mass factor if there is a one kilometer thick boundary layer profile. So a profile like this, where it's just a kilometer thick and then zero above that, we find profile one showing a high air mass factor, a high slant column that we would expect at low view elevation angle because you're going a long path through that layer. And then as you go to higher and higher elevation angles, the uh, air mass factor decreases because you're looking out of that layer right there. So we see is a profile looking a lot like the BRO profile we had last time, a decreasing amount versus uh, versus increasing elevation angle. If we flip over to profile 6, this is a stratospheric profile. What we see is the air mass factor is essentially 1 for the stratospheric profile. So it's always the same independent of where I look in the sky. What that tells us is that wherever you look in the sky, you're going to have the same uh, the same you're not going to have any variation in the signal as a function of elevation angle. And if we take it relative to the zenith, so relative to the 90 degree point, we'll find zero values for the slant column density everywhere for a stratospheric absorber. While if we take it relative to the zenith spectrum and it's down low in the atmosphere, we'll find that there is an increase in the amount observed, the air mass factor, or at a given fixed vertical column density in the slant column density, just like we saw for BRO. So clearly from this we can see BRO was down low in the atmosphere, down near the ground, like profile 1 here. These various other profiles here are showing that there's a strong sensitivity to the profile down near the ground by taking different model ones. Okay, 
Uh, so that's great. We can get the concentration profile out by this method. One of the complications is that if you put a bunch of aerosol around, the aerosol will change the path length and will then change these air mass factor enhancements at low elevation angle. So at low aerosol load, we saw this figure last time. As the aerosol load increases, what you see is generally the air mass factors go down and become more uniform between the zenith and the low elevation spectra. And the reason for that is, imagine a highly scattering atmosphere. You're in a whiteout. Whether you look up or horizontally, you see the same thing. So in a whiteout condition, the air mass factor doesn't vary at all, and therefore the visibility is really going to affect the trace gas retrieval. Again, we said that we can get at the visibility by making measurements of the O4 air mass factors and or O4 slant column densities and then fit them to air mass factors in order to determine what the aerosol optical properties are. And then we're going to use those aerosol optical properties measured by O4 where we know the concentration over to measurements of BRO or other trace gases where we don't know the gas concentration. Okay, so the overall result from the radiative transfer concepts is that the tangent view always gives you a high sensitivity. For ground-based max dose, you get tangent to the concentration down near the ground by looking at a low elevation angle. One degree elevation angle gives you the most information content for what's down near the ground. We can remove the stratosphere by taking measurements relative to the zenith, and by taking it relative to the zenith, we'll only observe the gases that are down low in the atmosphere because we've removed the common path through the stratosphere. However, as the sun sets, the stratospheric path becomes tangent, and the uh, measurement will become larger and larger relative to a fixed noontime reference. So we st still can get stratospheric information, but the stratospheric information will come in a different way as a twilight spectrum. Typically when we are interested in trace gases down low, we won't do the second analysis, but that information does exist in the spectra. Okay, so how are we going to get vertical profiles out of these max dose data. The way that we do this is a method called optimal estimation and this optimal estimation analysis uses a forward model. The forward model is also called a radiative transfer model which describes how light scatters around in the atmosphere and we will predict the differential slant column density of a gas as a function of elevation angle that will result from a certain assumed profile. The assumed profile will then be adjusted in order to get the best agreement between ds of the gas as a function of elevation angle alpha and the actual observations. So we're going to make those adjustments and get the best fit we possibly can. This is also called inverse modeling because we're taking a forward model that goes from what we want to know, the gas concentration profile, to the observational space, and we want to invert from the observational spec space back to the vertical concentration profile. So this optimal estimation is also called inverse modeling. A key aspect of optimal estimation analysis, or any inverse modeling, is that it reports on the information content that was originally in the observations. And you want to be careful not to overinterpret your results uh, because there is a limited amount of information that the observations actually constrained. So I'll go through that in the next couple slides. Okay, a key assumption is something called the a priori assumption. The a priori is the uh, assumed vertical profile that we're going to use in making this analysis. The forward model that we're going to use typically will take something like 20 layers to model the atmosphere. But we only measure a few elevation angles, maybe five. Some groups measure up to 10 different elevation angles. So we clearly don't have enough information from 10 measurements 
to get 20 layers of the atmosphere. So we can already tell we're going to need some other constraint because the problem is under underdetermined. That constraint that we use is called an a priori profile. And that a priori profile is the best idea of what the profile would be in the absence of any other information. To the extent that the observations say that that a priori is incorrect, uh, we will have true information in our, our measurements. Said another way, if you use an op a inverse modeling method like this and you gave it no data, it would return the a priori profile because that's what you told it the profile would be in the absence of any other information. You can do better than that by adding more information, that is to say 5 to 10 measurements of slant column density at different elevation angles, but uh, you're only going to get up to something like uh, a few independent measurements in the actual uh, that are being constrained by the observations. We'll see that in the next couple slides. So what we'll do now is go into a demonstration of the optimal estimation fitting using the HIPRO algorithm, which was developed by Udo Fries at University of Heidelberg. And the interface you'll see is actually his IDL interface to this code running on some UAF Max DOS data. So this is the HIPRO algorithm by Udo Fries fitting some UAF Max DOS data. And I'll walk you through what various windows we are looking at right here. First off, we're looking at aerosol extinction fits and we're going to be looking at the amount of O4, the O4 slant column density or optical depth on vertical axis right here. Remember the raw measurements are a time series of the optical depths as a function of the elevation angle. And the low elevation angles are in the blue or cold colors and then going over to red at higher elevation angles. You see the boxes here are the measurements and then the X's are the modeling of those measurements, which are pretty close to the measurements there. And it's going through and fitting each of these sequentially, and then it, it's going to jump over to the next uh, day here. We're using UT time, and so midnight is actually about here for this uh, buoy at this time of year, just based on where it was. So that's the observations that are trying to be modeled. What is uh, constraining the model is the a priori. So if we look right here, this panel shows us the aerosol extinction a priori profile. In this case, starting at 0 0.05 per kilometer at the ground and then decreasing linearly to 3 kilometers and then 0 above. So a boundary layer type of profile to start with. And then there are uh, on this panel right here, the measurements and the model. So uh, these are all the measurements within an hour, and that includes a couple of vertical profiles. In this case, one vertical profile, two vertical profiles. These high measurements right here are at low elevation angles, and then as the elevation angle increases, the observations decrease, just like the model does. But you see the model isn't doing that great initially, but it's getting better and better as this fitting iterates through to get the best profile. Okay, so uh, what's being done is the radiative transfer model is being run on this a priori profile. And then we calculate if you changed each layer, how it would make this fit better. And uh, that those changes then are what adjustments are being made to get a better fit. So let's watch that again. It's about to start going through and adjusting the model. See the model's getting better, better agreement, and the aerosol extinction is actually going quite low in this case. It looks like it's a very clean situation. So uh, it continues to do that going through. And then importantly, it calculates as an output the averaging kernels right here. 
The averaging kernel would be 1 if the sensitivity in that layer was unity, and we see that at the lowest layer there's almost a 1 value down near the ground, indicating that we have quite a good sensitivity to the surface extinction. Then these decay as you go aloft, and you can see there's not much amplitude above on the order of 2 kilometers, indicating that most of our sensitivity to this aerosol is down low with this way of modeling the data. Okay, and then we can summarize these results by calculating summaries like the aerosol optical depth or optical thickness at 361 nanometers, and we see the measurements like this. So we've now observed how the fitting routine gets the optimal estimation fit of the extinction profiles from the O4 data. Uh, the resulting extinction profile gives you the extinction, the light extinction, in inverse kilometers for every layer. So it'll tell you the best modeled uh, extinction profile that agreed with the observational data. And we saw the model f adjusting to get better agreement to the observational data. Additionally, the optimal estimation fitting re reports averaging kernels that describe the sensitivity of the uh, measurement to various different layers in the model. We can sum the diagonal elements that is to calculate the trace of the averaging kernel matrix and the total sum of those diagonal elements or the trace is the number of degrees of freedom for signal and it tells you the number of independent measurements that were truly there in the observations or were constrained by the observations. Typically for aerosol retrievals we have about two degrees of freedom meaning that there are two independent pieces of information. Because we're tangent in our tangent geometry uh, with a near horizon view, uh, we pretty much always are able to retrieve the surface extinction down at the ground as one of our pieces of information. And we'll usually report that, the surface extinction, as one piece of information. The other piece of information that we get, we usually consider to be the integral of the extinction as a function of altitude, which is known as the aerosol optical thickness or aerosol optical depth. And those two pieces of information, the surface extinction and the aerosol optical thickness, are the two degrees of freedom that we usually constrain pretty well by this fitting. Okay, uh, a couple more things about this. First off, the extinction measurements are at ambient conditions, ambient relative humidity, and are not under dried conditions. Many observations you'll see in the literature will be aerosol that has been sampled and dried, and then the extinction of those aerosol have been measured. That's not directly comparable to the measurements we've got right here. And because you need to know how those aerosols swell as a function of relative humidity to adjust them back to the ambient relative humidity. So it's one thing to be very careful of in utilizing these data. Um, secondarily, we did get some information from the fitting about the altitude of where the uh, aerosol extinction is. So there is some information beyond what I'm representing here. Or said another way, we have some idea of the layer height where the AOT maximizes. And for the type of data we get, very often the AOT will maximize aloft. And this maximization aloft is probably due to clouds and layers that are aloft where there's a lot of light scattering aloft that's limiting our path length. So uh, those are the type of fit results we'll get. Once we have the O4 results uh, that have been used to constrain the aerosol model, we will have an idea of the path lengths, essentially the light scattering around the atmosphere. And we can use that information in a second round of optimal estimation modeling to calculate gas, trace gas profiles. 
For our measurements, we typically get about two degrees of freedom for the gas measurements. And for our gas measurements, we typically map them onto a lower tropospheric partial vertical column density. That is to say the integral of the number density from the surface to two kilometers, which is about the height where the averaging kernels indicate no more sensitivity to BRO. And then we will also calculate the surface extinction, oh, I called it surface extinction, I'm sorry, surface concentration of this trace gas in the zero to 200 meter layer. So we get a lower tropospheric vertical column density of the trace gas, and then a surface uh, averaged concentration over the lowest 200 meters. Those can give us a picture of the vertical distribution of this trace gas, and we've found it to be very variable for uh, BRO over the Arctic Ocean. Sometimes it's a very shallow layer where most of the absorption, most of the trace gas amount is in the lowest 200 meters, but sometimes it lofts up more like this 2,000 kilometer type region.